I'm recording now. Um, All right, I will share the screen. Welcome to the 30 second talk in this series. Um, I better make um, Lou into a co host. Okay. And I think everybody else should be muted. But not Lou. Um, Lou, can you unmute yourself? Yes, now you can hear me and you can see the screen, I hope. Yeah, yeah, we can. Very well. Since... Um, since after this for a month or so we are taking a hiatus and i was about to go into various things about corvana phomology i thought best to stop and talk about something self-contained for this time so i'm talking about and i have a another reason as you'll see to revisit this topic um on knots, collapsing tangles, and a little bit about DNA recombination. This is work that Sophia Lambropoulou and I were doing a while back, and uh, there's more to say about it, and it's elementary and I think interesting. So I remind you that the topic is very much about on knots. Uh, this is an example of an on knot. As you can easily see, uh, well, you could easily see if you made a sketch of it and played with it a little. Um, yeah, it uh, is not exactly what we're calling a hard on knot. I'll explain what I mean by hard on knot as we go along. But it's kind of hard to see that this is uh, unknotted. Um, here's an example of a hard on knot. Uh, one that Ken gave many years ago. Um, it's a nice diagram. It's unknotted. You can easily see this is unknotted, um, probably more easily than you could see the other one because it has a, an undercrossing line uh, going through the middle of it. And if you were to swing that out, uh, why then you see that there would be a Rademeister 2 move that could be pulled in. And then you can even in your mind's eye, ah, uh, comment. Oh, nope. was there comment? No comment. You can see that you can swing that underline out, do a Rademeister two move, and then you can, I say in your mind's eye, see even another Rademeister two move, and you're done basically. So this one you could do in your head, but the problem with it is that if you are restricting yourself to doing Reitermeister moves, then there are no simplifying Reitermeister moves on this diagram. There are no moves at all of type three, except woven ones, which you can't do. And there are some two-sided regions, but they are also woven. So there's no way to simplify. In order to reduce this knot to the unknot, you have to make it more complicated before you make it simple if you're using Reitermeister moves. Actually, you only have to bring it up by two uh, crossings before you can then do simplifying Reitermeister moves, but two is two. And so we call such a thing a hard unknot if it cannot be undone by Reitermeister moves without creating more crossings. And we were interested in producing more of these. Let's make more of these. Uh, so that's the paper, which you can find on the archive and which is published in a book of papers that are related to a conference that we held in Trieste back in 2009, I think. Um, and then there's a related paper by Alison Hendrick and myself where we are playing with the same theme, and that I won't be talking about here, but we, we looked at uh, Dinikov's uh, work and, uh, where there is an unknotting algorithm by simplifying moves, but the moves are moves on arc diagrams and different from Reitermeister moves, but every 
arc move, every Dienikoff move um, can be factored into randomized right moves. And you can think about that to figure out how many, how big a diagram do you need in order to unknot a knot starting in that way. So we start with a Morse diagram translated into a Dienikoff diagram and get that we get a quadratic upper bound for the number of crossings you have to introduce. Okay, so that's a related question which I won't be talking about today. How many crossings you need to introduce in order to get your knot unknotted? But here's the uh, startling result from a while back. Uh, let's see, do we have a date on that? 2001, Haas and Ligarius proved that an unknotted diagram, if you're using Reitemeister moves, can be transformed to the trivial knot using only two to the C1n Reitemeister moves, where C1 is a certain constant and n is the number of crossings in the diagram. Um, perhaps not the best possible result. In fact, way too big. Um, but it, and there was no... Um, no proof of that, that that was way too big until a few years ago when Lackenby proved that you could change the power of two to simply the number of crossings raised to some power, 11 in this case. So that's the best result at the moment, that you can unknot a, a diagram with um, that many Reitemeister moves. Uh, and, and probably that's much too big too. Um, but it's way better than the original Haas-Lagarius result. So I'm not talking uh, any further about the number of Reitermeister moves except in the practice of looking at some examples. We're just trying to produce some examples that are a bit hard to not. So for example, here's that, uh, that culprit of uh, Ken Millet's. And here I am unknotting it by strictly by Reitermeister moves. So I do a little push, and now I have a diagram with ten, with uh, twelve crossings rather than the original ten. And then you see swinging the arc becomes possible um, by just doing some three moves and some simplifying moves. Just swing along until that arc is out. And once the arc is out, you can pull it in. Um, and pull it in and simplify. So, so all that you needed was to get it two more crossings up, and then it could be simplified. How many crossings up do you really need? That that would be it. Would be good to have a really definitive theorem about that. So we're going to look at rational tangles and rational knots in order to uh, create some examples. So I remind you what rational tangles and rational knots look like. Uh, <clears throat> you, um, this is a rational tangle. And uh, you can recognize a rational tangle by um, trying to undo it by twisting adjacent strands. On the right of this tangle, you can twist. That's, of course, not a topological move on the tangle, but it's, a, it's an operation on the tangle. Twist those strands a couple of times and they disappear. And having twisted them, the lower two strands can be twisted and they'll disappear. And having done that, you'll have a little horizontal collection of, of twists and you undo it. So a tangle that can be made from two parallel arcs, horizontal or vertical, by twisting adjacent strands again and again, uh, is called a rational tangle. And you make knots out of them by closing them. Numerator is closing it top to top and bottom to bottom. And I've indicated the um, way I think of twists um, for these, but I'll come to that in a moment, the way I count twists. Then uh, you have the numerator and denominator closures, as I said. And now we have the naming of the tangles. Um, so the horizontal tangle, I'm naming them in an unoriented fashion. If you look back at Conway's original paper, he has a slightly different naming scheme because he's using oriented tangles. We're doing Conway's theory here of tangles, but we're writing it in an unoriented fashion. I've also indicated the shading uh, for a mnemonic purpose. 
Um, so this is the zero tangle, and if I twist horizontally that way, that's one. And uh, how can you recognize one? Well, if you were to shade it, you'd see it, or if the shaded crossings form um, A crossings for smoothing the bracket, if you're thinking of doing the bracket. Or if you take the overcrossing line and swing it counterclockwise, it will sweep the interior regions, the shaded regions there. So that's plus. Minus um, is over here, and then the A smoothing is vertical rather than horizontal. So this is two, that's minus two. And then vertical twists are reciprocals in the tangle fraction domain. I'll explain the generality of that in a moment. But if you, um, if you take the mirror image of a given tangle, it's going to be the negative. So the, the, if you take the mirror image of one, it's minus one. If you take the mirror image of two, it's minus two. If you take the mirror image of one half here, then it's minus one half. And you'll notice that in what I call one half, all of the horizontal smoothings are A-type smoothings. So you go down vertically with horizontal smoothings of the positive type, and I call it one over that M. If you go horizontally with positive, with smoothing, with um, with things that have an A-type smoothing in the horizontal, I call it N. Um, and um, and infinity, of course, is one over zero. Um, rational tangles, um, in in the most general form, the way I describe them, are. Uh, obtained by putting twists, and they may be put on the right or on the left or on the top or on the bottom, but you can certainly undo this by a sequence of, of um, adjacent strand moves. Operations on tangles that correspond to algebraic operations are addition, where you have two tangles next to one another and you connect them up right edge to left edge. Vertical composition, which I call star, which is to take bottom edges to top edges. And rotation, which is 90 degree rotation. And you can think of 90 degree rotation as um, pull the left upper strand down and the right lower strand up, and then keep the endpoints fixed and rearrange it and you see it does 90 degree rotation. In demonstrations at a blackboard, it's easy to rotate something by 90 degrees by not really rotating it, just pulling the strands. The fraction is satisfying, the fraction of a tangle exists and is satisfying the following rules. That the fraction of the sum is the sum of the fractions, the fraction of the rotate is minus one over. We'll do an example in a moment. And the fraction of a star product is one over the sum of the reciprocals of the individual fractions. If this looks like the rules for electricity, uh, it is the rules for electricity, uh, for conductance, but I won't go into that either. But these are the rules for fractions, and let's see how that works. For example, back in our list of elementary tangles here, um, uh, somebody must be the rotate of somebody. Um, if we take two and we rotate it by 90 degrees, we get this one. And I said that the fraction of the rotate would be the negative reciprocal of the fraction. The fraction of this is the number that I've indicated, two, and the negative reciprocal of two is minus one half. So this is working at least for those. Uh, let's figure out the fraction for somebody more complicated. So here you recognize uh, that these bits here are a two, and that's a minus, I write minus two just to indicate that it's ne it really is minus one half if you looked at it all by itself. But I'm just talking about the degree, the relative degree of twisting that I'm looking at. 
the A smoothing horizontal is um, is uh, the smoothing horizontal is a B. So this is a negative twisting situation. It would be minus one half all by itself. This is a three. So I would indicate this tangle by two minus two three, and we'll see that that's oh, that corresponds to a continued fraction. Ah, but let's try to figure out what is the fraction of this tangle. All right, it's the sum of these two, some happening here, and this one is two, for sure, by definition. This one, we'll have to figure out, so let's call it x. Well, I know that minus one over x is the 90 degree rotate of it, and I can recognize that minus one over x is, well, what do you have here? You have two, and what do you have here? You have, negative one-third, right? See, the horizontals are not A's, they're B's. That's minus one-third there. Well, this is minus one-third plus two is minus one over X. That says that X is equal to um, one divided by, I'm, I'm getting rid of a minus sign and made a mistake, didn't I? Huh? Somebody made a mistake. No, I didn't. I want to multiply by minus one both sides of this equation, and that gives me one third minus two. Yeah, okay. So x is one divided by minus two plus one third. And so the tangle is two plus one over minus two plus one over three. And that is a continued fraction of the form two plus one over minus two plus one over three. And that is denoted by two minus two and three. And it turns out to be seven fifths. So there's um, an example of how to find the fraction of a tangle. You might wonder, uh, you might wonder, how do you define the fraction so that it's a topological invariant? If I find that I never mentioned that in the slides, I'll come back to it. But there are various ways to define the tangle. So indeed, it's clearly a topological invariant. Here, I'm just telling you how to calculate it. So the Conway theorem is that two rational tangles are isotopic, if and only if they have the same fraction. <laughs> About as good a theorem as you could hope for. And uh, you'll notice that this example that we have here is not alternating, and that a reflection of it not being alternating is indeed the fact that when you went from a negative twisting part to a positive twisting part, you are not going alternating. You're going under, under in this case. If this had been a plus two here, then it would have been alternating, and in fact, if you have a tangle where all of the twist parts have the same sign, then it's alternating. The diagram will be alternating, as you can easily see. So one thing that you want to do to understand the Conway theorem, and I wanted to talk about understanding it a little bit here, is to understand that you can reduce your tangle to, an, to one where all the twists have the same sign. And the way to do that is to look for um, a consecutive undercrossing and swing it. In this case, because there is an uh, because there are uh, different signs, it's non-alternating, and you can take this arc and swing it. And you can swing it all the way up and around. And when you look at that, you'll see that it has fewer crossings, and it's still rational. So that's the idea of the reduction. If you have something like this, a little black box of tangle, and somebody going between one twist setup and another twist setup, could be in a larger diagram, uh, and it's not alternating, then that means that you're going to have a double over between one twist and another. You can swing it. You can swing it and then turn it around, and you'll see that, lo and behold, you have definitely have another uh, rational tangle. Uh, I've illustrated it. In, this, in the case of the example we were just looking at. Swung that, flipped it around a bit, and that 7 fifths turns out to be 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2. So um, that's the idea, 
because you see, now we're in the domain between arithmetic and topology. If you have a fraction like seven fifths, you can rewrite it as a continued fraction by Euclid's algorithm and get one plus one over two plus one over two. Fine. Uh, then you can draw the diagram of one plus one over two plus one over two, the pl one plus one over one plus one over two. You can draw the, uh, the diagram and get a tangle. And that tangle will be a good canonical representative for the fraction, and it has the right fraction. So by using that and arguing a bit, you can prove Conway's theorem. You need to know that the fraction of a tangle is indeed an invariant of the tangle, and you need this observation that I'm showing you, and you can get a proof of the theorem. Um, here is uh, uh, a useful uh, method for uh, drawing, uh, drawing these things. The continued fraction form looks like this, 1a1 plus 1 over a2 plus 1 over a3 plus 1 over a4 plus 1 over a5, and takes some two-dimensional space. But if you, if you pull it a little bit, it turns into a three braid with a little extra, um, a little extra decoration. Uh, a little closure at one end of the three braid and a little opening at the other end. And the three braid looks like a positive twist, then a negative twist, then a positive twist, and so on, going along like that. And it's often useful in trying to draw a tangle to do that. I'm just telling you lore. Um, I don't think we need that slide. Um, in the case of the culprit, um, you could look at it and say, well, mm, it's really two tangles except for that swing of an arc. I see those two tangles. What are they? And uh, take a look at their fractions. And you'll see that one of them has fraction minus three fourths. Um, and the other one has fraction two thirds. And what I'm saying that it cuts into two tangles is that I'm saying that it is the numerator of the sum of those two tangles but I'm just looking at the sum of the tangles and their value. And look at here, um, when you added these two uh, uh, fractions, you got minus one over 12. Now, if you were to draw minus one over 12, that's certainly unknotted. So there's a clue here uh, that the two fractions add up to something of the form one over something. We'll follow that clue. Um, then I, I do want to tell you about Schubert's nice theorem. If you have rational tangles with fractions p over q and p prime over q prime, um, and if k of p over q and k of p prime over q prime denote the corresponding rational knots taking numerators, then these are isotopic if and only if p is equal to p prime and either q is congruent to q prime mod p or q q prime is congruent to one mod p. And we'll see a bit about why that's true, but that, that's the whole story about the knots associated as well as the tangles themselves. So in combination of Schubert and Conway, you have a wonderful theorem for understanding, uh, understanding rational knots. So part of the deal is here. Here is the tangle two plus one over three plus one over four. And over here is the tangle S, 4 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 2. I wrote it backwards. But they both have the same numerator, as you see. But you can see it very clearly in this braided form, because the braided form goes this way for getting the continued fraction expansion, 2, 3, 4. The, uh, and here, 4, 3, 2. Um, but when you close it up, you just get uh, a closure with a three braid form in the middle. And this is a very same closure. So the palindrome uh, or reversal uh, of a given continued fraction gives you the same uh, knot. Ah, but what's the relationship there? Well, the fact of the matter is that if you, um, if you look at the, the fraction corresponding to a continued fraction or the fraction corresponding to its reversal, then one will be p over q and the other will be p prime over q prime where q q prime is congruent to minus one to the n plus one mod p. How do you see that? 
the way you see that, I got to watch my time because I have some computer demonstration that I mean to do in a, near the end. But uh, but this is very nice. Here's a here's a, a matrix I recommend to you: A one one on the diagonal and zero below. And um, and then I tell you this that um, if you wish to look at the con the fraction p over q and get and its continu corresponding continued fraction a1 through an, then you should form the matrix product ma1, ma2, man. And having formed it, you will find a little matrix p, q, q prime, u, where on the left column, p and q, their ratio is the continued fraction. And p over q prime, along the horizontal there, is an, an minus 1 down to a1. The other one, the reversal. They're both there in that one matrix. And what is the determinant of that matrix? Well, the determinant of M of A is, oh, minus one. So the determinant of this product matrix is minus one to the N. So we have that P U minus q q prime is congruent to minus one equal to minus one to the n but then taking it mod p that says that q q prime is congruent to minus one to the n and there you have schubert's result in this case so that should give you an intuition about where the funny number theory came in in the schubert theorem Uh, to understand why this is working, um, just look at um, one step in, in the continued fraction. Um, P o, uh, A1 through An is, suppose that R over S is A2 through An. Hmm? And now we want to form A1, A2 through An. So that is by definition A1 plus 1 over all the rest. So that's a1 plus 1 over r over s, which is a1 plus s over r, which is r a1 plus s over r. Um, and then if you had already worked out the theorem in, by induction, r over s s prime u would be the product of ma2 through an. And you multiply by one more little matrix, you see it worked. It absolutely worked, right? You got the a1 r plus s and an R, so that the ratio of these is the new fraction. So that's the proof that this works. Um, and that's the story. Now comes the next point. The numerator of the sum of two rational tangles is a rational link. And I think I'm just going to state it and not worry you about it because I do want to do these computer demonstrations. But we get the following, that the numerator of P over Q plus R over S is unknotted exactly when PS plus QR equals plus or minus one. And that's the clue that I was following. You see P over Q plus R over S is PS plus QR divided by QS. And so that determinant equal plus or minus one tells you when this is unknotted. Um, you can prove it easily by playing with the technique that I just showed you. So we know that we know when uh, the numerator of the sum of two continued fractions will work out that way, be unknotted. And then the other point, which I'll get to, I think, in the next slide, Well, here are some more examples, but you don't really need them. Let's stay with that result that we now know how to make on knots out of out of fractions, and we'll come back and say it's something uh, more practical in a moment. But who wrote the first hard on knot? Uh, it wasn't Ken. It was Goritz back in 1934, um, and he made examples like this one. And um, this one. 
um, is another form of um, of, uh, of manipulation. If you happen to want to make some with a rope, you see that you can take that uh, that guy on the right and twist him uh, by 360 degrees, and two crossings will disappear, and then the twists will meet, and it will all go away. Uh, but you can see this as the sum of two tangles by looking at the vertical line going down through um, just after the three twist, and then you will see a rational tangle on the right and a rational tangle on the left. Um, all right, and and here I'm doing more than you care to see. Since I want to do some computer demonstrations, I won't worry, but I was just going through the same thing to see how many Reitermeister moves did I need and what did I need to do in order to uh, get this to undo. And then there are other small ones, like here's another small one, and this one is, um, is the, uh, oh, and now we, we get to an important point. Look at this example. Um, here's two fractions that add up correctly. And if you look at their continued fractions, you get the final clue. You see, the continued fraction of this one is 0, 1, 3, which is really 0, 1, 2, comma, 1. 3 is equal to 2 plus 1 over 1. This continued fraction is a truncate of this one, 0, 1, 2, comma, 1. Truncate it, and you get 0, 1, 2. And truncation is exactly going to produce the fractions that we want. Ah, uh, there's a term that people use called a convergent of a, of a fraction. A convergent of a plus one over b plus one over c is obtained by truncating it. I call it a truncation in my mind now and stopped using the word convergent. But here's the whole story if you want to work with continued fractions. You take a continued fraction and you knock out the last term. Um, so I take the one through six and I knock out the last term uh, and I would get one, two, three, four, five. That will work. Or I can regard at the end a one if I want to. And then I start with one, two, three, four, five, five, one and knock out the last term. I see I have uh, two fives there and that's a mistake. I meant five, one, not five, five, one, sorry. I'm looking for, uh, I think that given the amount of time we have, this is a good place to actually do an example. So let's do an example. Uh, I got into conversation last, the reason I resurrect, we've resurrected this is because of a conversation I had with Rob Shrine last week in relation to a project that we're doing with some students about getting computer programs to try to unknot things. And uh, I was telling Rob about this theorem that if you take uh, um, a continued fraction and he, he mo quickly modified not plot, so we could input the continued fractions very simply. So let's take two, three, four, and then we're going to add it to, but in this notation, I'm just going to write it, two, three, the truncate of two, three, four, and then Z is going to make this one into its negative, and sharp is going to add them, and we're going to have in front of us two, three, four, plus minus two, three. Two, three, four, plus minus two, three. And our theorem says those are the ones that are unknotted, all right? So that's, in the end, I went through a sketch of the theory and the way we were discovering these things, but that's the final fact in the end, very simple fact to state. You take 
a continued fraction, you knock off the end, uh, making a truncate, and you add the negative of that to the other one, and you'll get an unknot all the time. Um, so now comes the question, what does not plot do to this? Not plot self-repelling self program. Um, is it going to unknot this? Well, in its damped position, uh, not plot simply repels by um, a generalized electrical force of size one over R to the fifth by default. I do see it, uh, it might be going along at a good rate for a little while, and then it kind of slows down. Um, needs a little perturbation to be kicked along and do the rest, but there is a way to do some perturbation in not plot. In not plot, the, the, the data, of course, consists of just a collection of points in three-dimensional space, but each pair of points is connected by a string which when you're running the program in its damped form is contracted and won't be operating. But if I call it undamped, then the spring can act as well. And some energy of the system goes into the motion of the spring. Actually, this seems to be doing a nice job. It looks like it would unknot it eventually, but we're going to watch it unknot it a good deal faster by letting it become undamped. There it is, it's gone. So that's amusing. Um, uh, is not plot going to always succeed? Let's try, let me show you a harder example. A genuinely harder example. Now this is seven eight one, which is really seven nine. But as I said, one way one way to get the truncate is to take the last number and subtract one from it, uh, or think of it as having a one. And there's our beastie, and uh, I'll give it something, a little protection there. And we'll go damp. And done, Dan. You see me draining kinetic energy out of the system so it doesn't go a little too wild on me. You just watch it go through some gyrations that took it a little closer to being unknotted. I'll stop its motion and go back to damp so we can look at this. That's as far as it will go. You could let this now run for hours and hours and hours and it will just oscillate around in this form. It needs this, it needs this arc here to be pulled up over this mass of stuff in order for it to get any further in the unknotting. And it won't do that. Um, so it's stuck. Um, 
So this suggests that the self-repelling field all by itself, even augmented by a little bit of perturbation, is not enough to unknot any knot. Um, we can produce many, many examples of this by using the hard unknots. Um, how do you prove that the self-repelling field can get stuck? Um, other than by a computer example, I don't know. But of course, you could argue that we have proved nothing here, and indeed we haven't. Uh, we've only proved that this particular program is having trouble with this particular knot. But it's still, it's suggestive of a global analysis theorem about these fields, if we could only find a way to conceptualize that. But what about unknotting it further? Well, I went back to Rob and, um, and Rob said, oh, well, you know that basic, that in knot plot, although I have to give you some special permission, is another program which uses what's called the, I think, BCAF algorithm, um, which is um, more powerful for trying to do unknotting. That was part of a research project that Rob was doing with other people. Um, and how does that work? Well, let me demo it for you. We're going to take this configuration here um, and we're going to translate it into a knot in the lattice. So the first thing, the first commands here are the preparation for that. And then, and now if you were to look at this, and in fact, maybe we should go back and scale it in such a way that you can see it a little better. You can see that it's now um, got a lot of uh, lattice-like ups and downs in it. It's been translated into a lattice type knot. Um, and I want to scale it down so you can now see this newly processed version of the knot that we have. All right. And then I give it a command to check whether with its all so many extra crossings, it's safe for the algorithm to uh, work. It says it's safe. And so I can now um, load it into the algorithm and get it going. And now you're watching the algorithm working on this big thing, which is basically in a lot, and it, undid it. That collapse, of course, is not very illuminating, uh, but uh, that's what you just saw, is that it undid it. It undid it down to this. Uh, let, let's go back to this uh, lattice uh, method. For now, oh, so now you could ask, well, uh, how bad could that be? Um, how bad could that be? Um, could we foil the BCAF algorithm, the FACF algorithm. Could we foil it? Um, maybe we could. Um, uh, let me see if I have um, the example I was playing with. Yeah. yeah. Just save a little time. Um, what you saw me draw on the command line, it, oh, oh um, yeah, I made a mistake. Let me make sure I got it right. Yeah. Is the continued fraction seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, one? And then I just abbreviated that, but that's the one obtained by taking it and its truncate. And that's a picture 
of that guy after a while. So this is a, um, a very hard uh, unknot. Um, it isn't even easy to see that it's unknotted when you're looking at this, but this is the result of running it in the knot plot for a little while. And if you continue to run it, it will just slowly move around in that form. Won't be able to do very much. Now, if we, if we try that in the special algorithm, in the BFACF algorithm, um, I just did that. Um, over the last 12 hours. And I had the following experience. I started it at 12.30 at night and it, um, it went like it did before um, and kept on going and uh, it wasn't unknotted at eight o'clock in the morning. And then I left it alone for a while and looked at it a few minutes ago and um, it was unknotted. So somewhere in that period of almost 12 hours, after eight o'clock somewhere. So eight o'clock was hmm, around seven and a half hours. So maybe at the nine or 10 hour point, it actually did unknot it. Now what is happening in this algorithm is that the knot is being put on a lattice and then you do lattice moves on the knot. Lattice moves are very simple. You just push an edge in the lattice up or down or over. Um, and uh, the, the knot does a Monte Carlo search uh, for um, for moves, um, and it's designed to be as ergodic as it can about the configurations in the lattice, and and just goes on doing that over and over again for a long time. So maybe it has a high probability of unknotting sooner or later. I'm sure it does. And in this case, I thought maybe I was going to foil it and and I would make it stuck, but uh, but it really did unknot this after a long time. Uh, I thought I would show you this um, lattice uh, knot algorithm for fun. Um, suppose that we started with a, that's another topic of course, but let's see it work in that way. Let's take a torus knot of type um, four or five, for example. Oh, oh. How did that happen? Oh, I accidentally wrote the wrong one. Yeah, here's a torus knot of type four or five. Um, and let's prepare it a bit. All right. Now, what you would like to know, um, of course you would, is, uh, what, is uh, what is a nice, uh, reasonably sized, perhaps smallest lattice knot that corresponds to the torus knot of type four or five? So again, you can go through the yoga of this program. And now, of course, it's trying to reduce this. And there it is. It's done. Oh. I'm sorry, I made a mistake there. Ah. That's better. Um, I need to know how to stop this. Let's see. There. Okay. So that's what the well, that's what the algorithm did. It produced a, a lattice knot uh, as small as the algorithm could produce for the four five torus knot. Uh, and so, if you happen to be interested in um, finding uh, knots on lattices that correspond to knots that you know. Uh, that algorithm can be used to that purpose. So, um, so that's one of the reasons why I 
thought it would be interesting to revive this subject and talk about it is because we can use these hard knots to experiment with in relation to this program, which is trying to unknot knots. Um, of course, the, uh, oh, wait, one moment. I'll be right back. I wanted to show you something else. Now, uh, the question is whether you can see this, and it may be, may be better, maybe better, be better for me. Uh, there, uh, right now, you, now I know what you're seeing. Um, if you're thinking about how how do unknots occur in physical reality um, in the easiest possible way, I claim they occur in the way that we were just looking at. You see, suppose you had a say a strand of DNA, and, uh, and it got twisted. All right, that's a first order twisting. But then it's moving around and maybe a couple of other strands nearby, they get twisted. And now let's just stop at that point. And you see that what, what this divides into is an upper tangle, there are four points going along the middle of this thing that I've made. And in the upper part, you have a three twist. And in the lower part, you have a rational tangle consisting of the negative of that three twist and another twist at the bottom. So this is the numerator sum. What, I, what you're looking at is the numerator sum of this three twist and this three twist and the four twist. It is fraction and truncated fraction. And then if you were doing the Guritz trick, you could take that part and twist it around itself a couple of times like this. And, and you, would be, you would have in your hands a Guritz type hard on knot. So these occur completely naturally uh, and um, and with uh, with an appropriate kind of piece of rope like this one, you can make them easily enough. But that's one of the uh, that's an intuitive reason why you expect that rational tangles and rational tangles that will cancel each other like this are occurring in situations in physical situations like DNA because it's energetically fairly easy for two strands to start wrapping around one another it is energetically more complicated for something like this to uh, maybe form a global knot like this, um, which would also make it unknotted. But, um, but for it to go through, um, go through um, some kind of uh, motion that took it through itself in the large like that would, is certainly at a different energetic level than just twist local twisting. So, so one can think about that, and I don't know how to discriminate between those different levels at which nodding can, uh, unknotting can occur in reality. Uh, and of course, in the DNA, In the DNA, people have modeled uh, uh, have modeled these by restricting to things that are rational at first, and watching how re DNA recombination works. So, um, so if, um, from back in the '80s to begin with, electron micrographs can show that DNA is knotted, um, and DNA recombination is the operation uh, of an enzyme which takes a bit of DNA and cuts it and cuts a nearby bit of DNA and then cross connects it like that. The cross connection might be as simple as just putting in a crossing. But even then, which crossing? Is it going to be this positive crossing or is it going to be 
the resulting um, thing, if you started with this bit of twist, would be the numerator of a rational tangle, but it'll be a different rational tangle if this was plus or if this was minus. And so you can think about um, successive recombination in DNA like this. Here's a, an unknotted DNA substrate, and it undergoes a bit of recombination here. Um, but it, not yet, all right? Uh, here it's just an unknot. But here it undergoes recombination. And we're assuming that the recombination is always that little right twist, every time a right twist. And it does it again and again and again. You get a sequence of knots and links. The first one is a half link, the next one is a figure eight, the next one is a whitehead link, and the next one is somebody. Um, so this is the reason why the tangle theory uh, for uh, rational knots and, and simple tangles has been used by Ernst and Sumners and others in studying DNA recombination. And experiments can be done where the, the recombination is marked by sites on the DNA and will happen processively in a fashion that's similar to this. So that you might start with an unknotted substrate and actually see in electron micrographs sequences of knots coming out, maybe the first three. And that would indicate very strongly to you that it was a simple right twist. And then you can analyze using the knot theory whether there's any other possibilities there. Uh, and so that leads to an interaction between actual knot theory and the DNA experiments. So uh, that perhaps is a good place to stop. Uh, and after I quit talking, I'll go back to doing more experiments with the program. Well, yeah. Fascinating, fascinating. <laughs> uh, well, uh, are there any questions for Lou? It's a bit late to ask, but did you remember to record this? I did record it, yeah, yeah. It's all down in black and white and color, right. So um, I, I wondered, why did, you said it was the, the, the attraction was one over R to the fifth. Is that right? Uh, you can, there's a slider in the program. You can use one over R squared, but it's a bit unstable. Oh. And, um, and if you go up to one over R to the fifth, it's quite stable in its, in its performance. Oh, okay. What happens with, uh, of course, is that the, as you go to farther and farther distances, the force is attenuated when you're using one over R to the fifth. Yeah. So you could experiment with it. I, I, um, I'm, not, I'm not as conversant with experimenting with it as I would like to be, but I did find that if I use lower powers and try to keep it stable, <laughs> then the knot can start to coalesce in some part of the line, whereas that never happens. It just seems to puff out uniformly all over the place at the higher power. I mean, can you... Is it possible to use fractional powers? Is, does that make sense? It um, would mathematically, but mm -hmm. it's not available in the... Oh, wait, no. In the program, it is available. Yeah, you can use fractional powers. Yeah. The program lets you do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, <laughs> I remember seeing uh, uh, Rob's work in, in, um, when he was in British Columbia, but um, this is really... It's continuing with it. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, the um, oh yeah. What, what material? That that silverish material. What was that? Oh yeah. This is a a bit of metal rope, uh, metal which you rope. can buy. Maybe I should send you the link. You can buy this on eBay. It's made yeah. by some Chinese company. Oh. It's um. Uh, you know, it's for jewelry. Yeah. Um, and um, if you pull on it a little bit, you see how it's made. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, oh, you know you can't, but soon you will. Pull it. Wait. There. You see it pull apart? Oh, and it's little cap, little, uh, uh, a nest of little capped things with an mm -hmm. elastic strip, uh, uh, an elastic strip. Right. In the middle. Mm -hmm. So it's a stack of little 
caps, little yeah. caps, uh, and little caps are stacked with an elastic strip going down the middle. That makes it very flexible. Yeah. Uh huh. And and if you want to make on knots with it, you can do that. Do them very quickly. You just do a few of these and and uh, and Guritz's twist and hand this to somebody and say, okay, would you unknot this? And um, and if you look at it and you think, oh, well, that looks going to be complicated. But if you grab it with your hands and try to unknot it, your hands undo it in a moment or two if you just don't think that uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we used to use popper beads in the old days when you could get them from Woolworths. Yeah. I still have a supply of poppet beads. <laughs> I was inspired once by Larry uh, Siebenman. He gave me the address of a place where you could buy them and yeah. I bought a bunch. Yeah. <laughs> well, I had a question. Lou. I remember playing with the culprit in its Gauss code and the, and the Gauss code just, it, it just collapsed right away. It doesn't have a hard Gauss code. And uh, so I was wondering about uh, what doesn't have a hard in, Gauss code. Incorporate the culprit. The, the oh, oh, but but doing Gauss code. You mean you're doing Reitermeister moves on the Gauss code? Uh, I don't. I, I think I was looking at the structure of the interlacement information there, and, and it it went down very very easily. Uh, you you were using a computer program. No, no, no. Or you were doing it. You're doing it by hand. hand. Doing it by yes, hand, I, looking I at the Gauss code. Right. But, but if, if you took these hard on knots and restricted yourself to only doing Reitermeister moves, legal Reitermeister moves that were local on the Gauss right. code, not virtual ones. So what? And, what I'm curious. What uh, I'm that, but that leads about... to a question. I'm sorry. Let me interrupt you. It, uh, I just <laughs> thought of this question, which I haven't thought of before. What? What, do you, what efficiency do you get by allowing yourself to use virtual moves on the, on the hard <laughs> diagrams? Because after all, if it's unknottable classically, it'll be unknottable virtually. And when you're looking at Gauss code, you may could look at any Reitermeister right. moves whatsoever. Uh, and those would, some of those would be virtual. But maybe you were doing that. Sorry, I interrupted. I, I think in effect I was because I was looking at this structure that's abstracted from the Gauss code. Um, but I, so I was curious just about algorithmic implementations of things, whether somebody has implemented, for instance, an algorithm that looks for the tangle sum decomposition first. To, to well, that would be an intelligent algorithm. Yes. The, the algorithm I was showing you is, is um, very strong and very unintelligent the BCAF mm -hmm. algorithm. It's, it's, it's just era designed to be ergodic in the space of configurations as much as possible. I, I mean, uh, Lou, have you, have you looked at the, 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 ga uh, the um, chord diagram of this? Does that, is that? Yeah, a, we were just talking about Gauss code chord diagram. Yeah, that's, that's what so I mean. You, you, you're saying that's the same thing. Not quite. Well, formally, formally, the chord diagram and the Gauss code are the same thing, but of course, yes. the crossings of the chords are are, uh, are a lot of information about the knot. Yeah, I mean, you, you must be able to glean some information from how the chords cross. Right. <coughs> it's simpler than the knot diagram itself. Right. And, and there are chord diagram, as, as Lou was saying, there are, there are chord diagram Reitermeister moves that will be immediately available, that, that will be single moves, that are not moves in the knot diagram. You know, because you can bring things together by, by detour move and then, and then do a Reitermeister move. And that's allowed by the theorem that says that virtual knots, uh, classicals embed in virtuals. Sure, and, and the special statement is that, what is it, mutants of the unknot are all unknots, right? And so, if you if you take a, a knot that decomposes as a tangle sum, there could easily be a mutant of it that's much more readily unknotted. <coughs> so it would be a sensible strategy to look for that. And I, I was just curious whether you've looked for hard on knots 
that don't decompose as tangled? <coughs> oh, um, yeah. Um, well, I think if you, if you allow the kind of thing that I was just mentioning where you might take this thing and, um, and tie a knot in it and then do some other things, then it's not going to decompose into rational tangles, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what are, what are all, how do you, cla uh, yeah, I mean, if you could, if we had a good theorem to, to uh, characterize on knots, that would be useful. Or a good grading scheme, like the one they use for Sudokus, you know, the easy and the difficult and the evil and that kind of thing, you know, evil uh -huh, on knots. Uh -huh. <laughs> Truly evil on knots, right. <laughs> that could be the title of the next paper. No, that's the paper after evil on that. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, in the marches of the night, I was wondering what what sort of knot theory you could get with diagrams, and you're allowed R one and R two, but not R three. So it's like a like a doodle, but in fact, in having instead of having flat crossings, you had real crossings. Um, Mm -hmm. So uh, that would be, I don't know if anybody thought of that before. From your silent. Well, what you really are asking, ha has anybody <laughs> investigated it and done something yeah. with it? Yeah. 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 There's a, a recent book by uh, Ito, is it? Uh, that World Scientific, I think, put out called Not Projection. And right. there are detailed discussions of the effectiveness of various subsets there. So that would be a place to look. It's fairly recent. So can, can you can you send a, a, a reference round to to Lou and uh, we'll put it in the system. Sure. Thanks. Incidentally, um, on another matter, um, there was a, a lecture by Richard Hamming at Edinburgh. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I could send around the reference. It might be interesting to people uh, on coding theory. Oh, ah, mm -hmm. good. That'd be interesting. Yeah, I'll, I'll send around a reference. Yeah. Thank you. Are, are we meeting on Friday, or is this the we last? We certainly meeting? are. Um, so Lorenzo has vanished from the screen. Well, I was just getting you this book, so I have. Oh yeah. Wrong. It's a CRC book. Oh. It's not CRC. world scientific. I, excuse me, uh, apologies to all the world scientific uh, representatives here. It's a CRC book. And, um, you know, I, I think he addresses uh, the kind of thing you were asking about, Roger, about the effectiveness of special subsets of the, of the full spectrum of right and right. So oh, I, I have have not read it in detail, but no, it, I bet it's expensive. It, it's from the days when I still had a research budget. Yeah, um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I could try and get my university library to get it, but then I can't get to my university library, so <laughs> it's hopeless. Yeah. You could look for it on the internet. It might be around oh, somewhere. It might be around as a PDF file. Yeah. Thirty-five pounds and forty-three pence on Google Books, Roger. Right. Okay. Well, I guess I could afford that. But... As a poor pensioner. Yeah. <laughs> I could do without tea and biscuits for a whole week. <laughs> Okay, well, that's a um, splendid talk, and um, I'll stop recording now. And then, but we've got Friday to come, and provided Lorenzo is still, his head is still above water, <laughs> we look forward to your talk on the Guritz matrix. Thank you very much. Apologies if my, the weird lighting and everything from my basement was a distraction. Oh, no, certainly not. No. Okay. So, okay. I'll stop recording somehow. <laughs>